Thank you. Um, so my name is Shayla Clark. I'm a genetic counselor um, and also a project manager for NIMAG. And um, today we have a really awesome um, workshop planned where it'll be interactive with some polls, some um, discussion, breakout rooms, and then we have a really good panel put together of a diverse range of speakers. And we just um, are so excited that you're here and that you wanted to join us today. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen um, so we can get started. And I just want to make sure that you guys all see my presentation, right? It's perfect. Perfect, got it. So um, we, the title of this workshop is Unrecognized Privilege, Removing Barriers to Equ um, Establish Equitable Care and Engagement. And um, none of our panelists nor myself have anything to disclose. So with that, we have a, a really cool icebreaker activity planned. We're going um, to pull the audience to kind of get you all warmed up to some of the topics we'll be discussing today. So this first question will take some time to, um, or the first two questions will take some time to answer it. What settings do you have a role in creating change? All right, so I'm seeing answers coming in, but like you said, this takes a little bit of thought. So we've got about 15% of people have made it through and I'll just keep watching the answers as they're coming in. When it slows down, I'll give a countdown. And you can play along yourself and guess what do you think will be the most the most popular answers for where people have a role, identify as having a role and where people wish that would like to have a role. You want me to give my guesses? If you would like, I'm saying that that's something you can do while you wait for the um, answers. <laughs> I'm going to guess that majority of people have a role of creating change within their communities. Um, and for those who are providers, um, or public health practitioners, I'm going to assume through patient care or patient navigation. Mm -hmm. so we'll see, I'm really excited to see the answers. All right, yes. And there's always the option to add, to <laughs> elaborate on any answers in chat throughout this entire presentation. And there will be questions um, for the panel. People can put those questions in or comments all along as we go. I think the answers are slowing down. So you're gonna get your wish. I'm gonna end this poll in three, two, one, and I'm gonna launch the results so everyone can see them. We got the whole range, which is, is one thing I expected. A lot, majority of people through patient navigation and patient advocacy and within the community health organizations and through patient care. It's great, nice range. Any, were any, was anything shared in the chat about another one not indicated? Not yet, but if people want to comment in chat, you know, what they, people might even have comments about what they noticed between the difference between where they feel like they have power and where they wish they had power, because the poll results are different. Would you like to go to the next question you have for the audience? Yes, we can go ahead to the next question. Would you like to introduce it or you want me to just put that up there? Um, you can just put that question up there and then um, I'll speak on it afterwards. Um, which of these apply to you? And click all that apply.
And then after we get the answers to this poll, I'm going to re-poll using the same answer choices. Yeah, you've got about half half people participating at the num the start the numbers starting to rise quickly now because people are making their way through all of these, and there is a difference. You know, there are, um, some answers are up to eighty seven percent, and some are as low as fifty seven percent. Currently, is the lowest answer on there? Is it just over half the people? So you, you can. In a moment, I'll reveal the answers. All right, I'm gonna count down from five, four, three, two, one, and end the poll and share the results. Great. So all of these options here were all um, barriers that our panelists noted were present in their experiences with genetic services. So these, um, answer choices came directly from the panelists you'll hear from today. So um, these are all things that are privileges for some of us and barriers for other of us. So um, with that, I want to go ahead and pull one more question. Yes, there you go. And which of these have you never identified as a privilege? And I'll remind the audience that all of these polls are set to be anonymous. So the answers that come in are anonymous forever. And you are getting answers here, Shale. I'm just like giving people some time since these, these are questions that came, like you said, directly from the panelists. And there's definitely people who are responding to some of them if they just haven't thought of that as a privilege in the past. Still a few coming in, but I think this might be a good time to transition to start talking about the choices or start talking about these. So I'm gonna end the poll. This is your last call for poll, three, two, one. And now here's how they showed up, Cheryl. Nice, so let's see. Seems like um, one of the top choices that weren't known to be a barrier where I feel comfortable making medical appointments, calling my providers to ask questions and finding new healthcare services when I need them. With the second highest one is I feel that I can ask my medical providers for what I need and can question them when I don't agree with their decision. Um, and these are very, very big barriers for a lot of people when navigating the, um, the healthcare system in general, um, especially when they are of an underrepresented minority group, um, an immigrated, um, an immigrant population, or you know, another individual that is usually goes unseen throughout the their medical journey. So again, these were um, options that were come up with by our panelists, all barriers that they ha may have seen their patients face or them, them themselves have faced. So we kind of wanted um, to warm you all up to the topics we'll be discussing today and to get to thinking about some barriers that go unrecognized um, as a person is navigating their genetics journey.
So with that, we um, want to go into some breakout rooms to have some further discussions about these kind of unrecognized barriers or privileges that exist and kind of see how everyone is, is thinking in a, in a smaller group setting. Um, I hope you all had some very rich discussions in the, um, the breakout rooms. So we're gonna, um, I'll pass it over to Erica to get all right. our interviewer started. Absolutely, my favorite thing to do. <laughs> so, so we have, I promise, I said, when you came into the breakout rooms, you're sharing stories and that there would be an opportunity to to put those stories up on the screen for people to look at. And so the way to do that is I'm gonna post a link in chat. And when you click on, oops, when you click on this link that I'm gonna post next, you can share a story of how you've seen privilege show up in your experience with genetic services. When you click on the link, you just type that in the box. And then as those stories start coming in, I will share the screen so that people can read and see a little bit of that. And again, to remind people, this is just a, this is an anonymous poll. And there's, and so your results will be anonymous and they will be seen by the people who are in this meeting as well as this session is being recorded. I also saw someone say in the chat that they would love to dis continue these discussions further. After this workshop today, there will be an opportunity for everyone to come together and continue um, discussions to kind of wrap up the conference for the day. Yes, absolutely. So we have a long tradition here of what we call the after party, but it's just time for people to continue conversations. We'll open rooms on different topics, sort of like putting signs on the door so that people know they want to gather with other people. Kind of like when you go to a conference like this, there's conversations that just want to happen, right? On the car ride home or let's go out for dinner. So we try to keep that same spirit going. And this, so this meeting will have a soft close and there'll be rooms for people to continue conversations specifically on these topics and other topics. So we are getting some answers here in Shayla. So I'm gonna go ahead and screen share these so you can see them, everyone can see them as they're coming. Oh, Shayla, it looks like you're muted currently, by the oh, way. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I should be better at this after two years of Zoom. Um, let's see, having not only written materials in other languages like Spanish, but also using understandable terms. I've seen lack of privilege in Spanish-speaking immigrant patients who often, um, lots of really great stuff. $250 is a lot of money for many for testing disparities in health literacy, longer time to diagnosis, differential access to care coordination, lots of great things. Being shared insurance, big one. Navigating the healthcare system is incredibly difficult. Even for those of us with high levels of education is difficult. So only imagine for those who don't have any help. Underrepresented, underrepresentation of minority groups in genetics research projects. So Shayla, I'm just gonna jump up here to let people know that if they're still typing, unlike the Zoom polls, this, this doesn't go away. So I'm gonna take down the screen share in a moment so you can continue with the presentation. But if people want to continue answering this question, the link will stay active. Great, so um, with that, um, thank you for all of these really great thoughts. I have some slides to go through to kind of hit some different um, topics about barriers to genetic services for 
um, different patient populations, and then we'll um, get started with our panel. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with my slides. Um, which hopefully you guys can see my slide right here. Again, perfect, Shayla. Yes, great. Okay, so um, barriers to genetic services within diverse populations is a hugely important topic that could span many days. This presentation is by no means um, comprehensive, but during this time together, we've kind of chosen to focus our discussions around the medical concept of race, diversity in the genomics workforce, diversities in genomics research, improving care for the disability, LGBTQIA+, in immigrant communities, and on conversations about existing initiatives and future goals um, for more inclusive genetic services. So there are many areas where the practice of genetics can evolve to be more inclusive. And this is in the way that um, race and ethnicity is utilized in caring for families, the way sex, sexuality, and gender is used in caring for families, um, the ability and um, disability in caring for families, how diverse populations are included or excluded in genetic research, and then how we can diversify the workforce. And that is in race, ethnicity, LGBTQ status, language, disability identity, all of those things. So I wanted to go over um, a few definitions um, of structural and institutional racism, because this is a, a really a huge barrier within the um, healthcare system and further perpetuated when we get into more niche fields like genetics. So structural racism was defined initially by political activists Stokely Carmichael and Charles Vernon in 1967. And it's a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations and other norms work in various often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. And this term is sometimes used interchangeably with institutional racism, which refers to the policies and practices within and across institutions that intentionally or not produce outcomes that chronically favor or put a racial group at a disadvantage. Um, Race-based medicine, um, is something else that has very harmful effects um, in the medical system. Race is a social construct. It's a human invented classification system invented as a way to define physical differences between people, but has more often been used as a tool of oppression and violence. Um, Race-based medicine is the system by which research characterizing race as an essential biological variable translates into clinical practice leading to inequitable care. Race-based medicine often leaves patients of color especially vulnerable to harmful biases and stereotypes. Um, and as an example, the use of race and ethnicity in medicine is especially relevant in genetics and has greatly been misused in the past in this field. Um, so how exactly does this exacerbate health disparities? Well, physicians often take a patient's race into account when making a diagnosis or ruling one out. Um, and for example, sickle cell anemia is often known as a black person disease, whereas cystic fibrosis is considered a white person disease. But we do know that um, people of both races are affected by both, both of these diseases. Um, it's also said that people of color are genetically predisposed to diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and other chronic conditions. But we know that there are many social factors that factor into these chronic conditions. Lack of diversity in genetic research databases. So we know that genetic differences exist between individuals of different ancestries and genetic studies that focus only on a handful of populations are incomplete. And this is as it stands right now. Individuals of European descent account for less than one quarter of the world's population. However, a recent study showed that they make up more than three quarters of the participants in genome-wide association studies. Um, and just as an example, Asians who account for 60% of the world's population make up only 11% of participants in these studies. Africans, African-Americans, Latina, and Latinos comprise less than 4% of participants in this research study, but are more than 20% of the world's population. Furthermore, 
the um, majority of all genome-wide association studies came from people only living in three countries, and those were the United Kingdom, the United States, and Iceland. So you can see how there is a huge lack of diversity, especially um, ancestral diversity in these genetic research databases. Findings from studies also show that historically underserved populations are understudied and underrepresented in nationwide and global genetic research databases, highlighting that this exclusion of these populations, um, they're also excluded from health studies and the resulting benefits of these studies. Another topic that um, we'll cover through this panel is language concordance in healthcare. Um, language concordant care is that of clinical encounters in which the patient and care provider speak the same native language. Language concordant care enhances trust between patients and physicians, optimizes health outcomes, and advances health equity for diverse populations. Language discordant encounters occur when patients and healthcare providers speak different first languages, which may manifest as differences in proficiency and experience, and therefore hinder the ability to communicate the nuances that are critical for understanding. Um, also of note, historical events, um, as we know, have severed trust between communities of color, including immigrants with limited English proficiency and medical providers in the US. Lack of informed consent is a huge example of um, a major issue and barrier among patients with limited English proficiency. And this is why language concordance is a very important foundation um, in gaining trust, optimizing health outcomes, and advancing health equity in patients with a diverse patient population. So another topic for us to cover, barriers to optimal care for the LGBTQIA plus community. So this community experiences healthcare disparities and barriers to optimal care as well. Individuals who are transgender are a growing population with specific healthcare needs and um, specific barriers to care and specific health factors. For example, a major barrier right now is the way that sex and gender and family history is collected in the genetics clinic. Make, um, there is an underrepresentation of individuals from this community in healthcare professions and cultural competencies for working with the LGBTQIA plus community in healthcare settings is essential to reduce barriers and combat the socially associated health disparities that come from these barriers, um, especially when there's a lack of provider training and knowledge in this subject. Barriers to optimal care for the disability community. Um, the disability community experiences healthcare disparities and barriers for optimal care. For example, the way that health and disability is discussed in medical settings, um, including the genetics clinic, shows disparate priorities between families and the practice of genetics as it stands currently. As with other underrepresented groups, there's an underrepresentation of individuals from this community in healthcare professions. And again, cultural competencies for working with the disability community in these settings is essential to reducing barriers to care. Um, and again, there is a lack of provider training and knowledge in this subject area. And lastly, um, there's a huge need for workforce diversity in all of these subject areas in genomics. Studies have shown that patients have a higher trust and satisfaction levels during their medical visit when there is concordance of patient, physician, race, language, and social characteristics. Currently, the number of racial and ethnic minority individuals in these healthcare professions is not increasing to meet the needs of the U.S. population. The greatest deficiencies currently existing are those in Black, Hispanic, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander. And then there's also a lack of providers from other underrepresented groups that we just spoke about that are also lacking. So, Decreased access to healthcare, lower quality of care, and poorer health outcomes continue to be um, really powerful factors um, in racial and ethnic minority populations that increase in healthcare disparities. And despite the consistent, within genetic counseling specifically, despite the consistent acknowledgement of minority underrepresentation, the um, genetic counselor workforce has demonstrated very little to no change in um, the percentage of providers coming from racial and ethnic minority groups. Um, so this is 
really demonstrating the need for greater workforce diversity. And with that, I would love to introduce our panelists for today. Um, so we have seven very, very wonderful um, panelists who are gonna speak today, answer some questions that we have outlined. And we also wanna give the audience a chance to ask questions. But we have Erica Stallings Esquire, who is a lawyer, writer, and patient advocate. Jennifer Melendez, um, who is a hereditary hem hemorrhagic telangiectasia advocate. Scott Neal, who's a ClinSeq research participant. Amanda DeLeon, um, certified genetic counselor. Andy Cantor, who's also a certified genetic can uh, counselor. Kadeem Morgan, who is an adult with CF and a patient advocate. And Zarifa Roberson, who is a motivational speaker and correspondent for the disability community. And with that, I will, I'm gonna turn it over to Zarifa to introduce herself. Thank you, Shella. Thank you everyone for allowing me to speak this, um, this afternoon, um, depending on where you're located in the US or around the world. Um, hello, my name is Zarifa Roberson. I was born with um, orthogryposis multiplex congenia. I know that's a lot to say. Um, so I just tell people to say AMC, like kind of like the movie there, the AMC, just say AMC. Um, so um, orthogryposis um, multiplex congenia is a birth defect. It happens out of one out of 3,000 birth. So I happen to be that lucky one out of 3,000. It was just a blessing. For me, um, the, the unique thing about me, I have a twin sister. She does not have orthogryposis multiplex congenia, so it only affected me. Um, in my case, I was born with club hands, club feet, dislocated hips, a lot jaw. Um, about three years ago, I'm sorry, about four years ago, I had about, I had a jaw surgery that corrected my jaw. So I was able to get dental care as well as be able to eat. And we know we love to eat because um, I needed that jaw surgery to get to make sure I can eat. So it was a success, which is great. So I'm happy with that. Um, so and I'm very independent. Um, I drive a car with no adaptive technology or car modification. People are very shocked when they get in my car and they're like, wow, really? No modification? They're like, no, but put a seatbelt on, I do have a heavy foot. So I do tend to speed a little bit, but it's all good. I, I try to watch my speed. Um, I live independently. Um, currently, I'm staying with my mom. Um, until I get things back on track, currently looking for a job. Um, I'm a motivational speaker. Um, my platform is on sexuality versus disability. I travel the country speaking at different colleges and universities, um, educating society about sexuality in the disability community. As you know, sexuality in the disability community is very taboo. So I like to talk about something that's very personal to me, as well as being a member of the LGBT plus community as well. Something that I like to speak on as well from my personal experience. Um, so that's what I do as well as I started creating topics on people of color um, with disabilities at different um, various college campuses as well. We just had our last Zoom discussion on uh, Black college students with disabilities. Um, I'm doing one on um, being Black, being disabled, and being a member of, of a Greek letter organization, as well as being Black and um, being being a Black working professional in, in the workforce. And that's coming in, up in October. So I do a lot of different things in the disability community. Um, as well, my disability doesn't affect me. As you can see, I have a bachelor's of science degree from Millersville University, class of 2001. Um, that bachelor's of science is in speech communication with a minor in African-American studies. 
Then I went on to get uh, my master's of education from Coppin State University, um, class of 2008 in rehabilitation counseling. So as you can see, my disability doesn't prevent me. Um, having a genetic disability, it's kind of hard because most people, when they see me walk, they think I have cerebral palsy and and I kindly correct them and I say, no, I have orthoglycosis, multiplex congenia. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, let me wrap that around you a little bit. It's a lot, it's a tongue twister. Imagine being drunk and trying to say that at the same time. That's a lot. Y'all, my half of y'all probably like, what? Well, oh, okay. I'm not gonna even try. But um, it's it's a part of me, it's my disability, it's not all of me, but it makes up who I am as a person who lives in um and multi multiple identities living in this society. Thank you, I Sheila. I love that. Yes, I love that, Zaretha. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Okay, I'll go next. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, uh, having me here at this conference. I'm learning a lot, um, listening to everyone. Um, I am a research participant uh, through uh, National Institute of Health and uh, did a genetic genetics testing about three years ago. And, um, and so I was interested in finding out more about um, my health. And, um, and so one of the things that uh, as I'm listening to Zarifa, and it just reminded me of a story that when I was young, um, I, my mother told me, my mother who's a nurse practitioner, she told me that I had, was born with sickle cell trait. And so there was a great deal, her being in the healthcare industry, a great deal of attention and drama placed on this term and what it me meant and what I could do and couldn't do. And, and so it was, it, it was just a lot, a lot going on. Um, and, you know, years passed and, you know, I never paid any attention to it. Um, uh, but one of the things that that led me to want to to know more about my genetics is that um, my health <clears throat> um, my health really follows my mother, and whereas my brother's health follows my my father. Um, he, you know, my father was an ectomorph like my brother, my mother mesomorph like me. Um, and so when she died suddenly of a heart attack. Um, it made me want to figure out what in her line um, might cause this. What indicators could I glean to help my life so that it didn't end that way? And so that's kind of what gave me the impetus to want to know more about genetic testing. Um, and, uh, and, and so um, I, I've, I've got these results. I've sat down with my doctor a couple of times to discuss a couple of things. Um, and learning more about what some of the indicators in the research mean, because um, that was kind of one of the biggest parts of coming out of this research is that what do you do with the information? How can I, how can I use it to make my life more meaningful and positive? Um, so finding, still finding ways um, to do that. But um, I, I'm encouraged by um, the results. I'm encouraged by meeting people that were as curious about their own genetic testing. Um, so it was, so it's good. That's my, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Scott. Sure. Okay, um, next we have Kadeem Morgan, who um, was unfortunately unable to be with us today, but I'm going to share um, a slide and a little of his story for you all right now. So let me share my screen again. And oops, it's not my last slide. Okay. You were seeing the slide. You're seeing the slide? Yeah, how you had it a second ago. Okay. And now it's, um, 
you can just, you can probably write arrow through those first couple and you'll get to. You'll there's get his, to it's his slide, but now I can't see my notes. So. Yeah, if you want to back um, it out and put it in presenter view, and then, and this is for everybody following along because the hardest thing to do on Zoom is share your screen. Yes. Share your okay. slides. Give me just a second. Sorry about like, that. So I can see a bunch of you on screen. If you, if this has been you, if you have had trouble sharing your slides on Zoom, like give Shayla a little supportive <laughs> wave. Like, yes, <laughs> that that is just not intuitive, and then it takes over your whole screen. <laughs> yes. So, okay. I just want to make sure. Okay, I think I'm ready now. I just want to make sure. I... Okay, everybody can see my screen and the slide. So this is Kadeem Morgan. He is an adult with cystic fibrosis and a patient advocate. And something very unique about him is that he is African American and has cystic fibrosis, which is not something that we we see often. It's something that exists for people who are African American, but that is not the image of a person with cystic fibrosis that's usually shown to the masses. So. Um, he was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis when he was one years old. He grew up in a predominantly white area with a disease that primarily affects people who are white. He felt forced into an even more niche demographic because of this. There was no one with his condition who looked like him and very little people in his school looked like him. However, Kadeem was able to keep his spirit strong with his love of music. In high school, he was a part of um, the school band ensemble, he played the saxophone. He was in a jazz quartet, participated in African dance, and it's also a DJ. We'll have some music of his playing um, later during the conference, so you guys all can hear. He aspires to be a music therapist, a youth and child social worker, and a youth counselor. At this point, he has had two lung transplants to date, one in 2017 and one in 2020. And through this process, he was finally able to find that long awaited cystic fibrosis community that he longed for when he was growing up. Um, and I wanted to share a statement from one of his most recent blog posts on his website. It's called Being Black in the CF Community. And um, it ends with saying, from being a black youth to becoming a black man growing up in a predominantly white environment, I had and still have to hold myself to a certain standard to avoid discrimination and any other acts of inequality. Having CF while living in such a climate allowed me to view life as a whole from a very different, very special point of view. CF is me, but CF does not define who I am. I am a strong black man, but I'm also a human being like everyone else. So even though um, Kadeem couldn't be here with us today, I did wanna share a little bit of his story and a little bit of his own words. And next we have Jennifer. Jennifer, if you unmute, we'll all be able to hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can hear me? We can hear you now. Okay. Uh, today I will speak about my personal experience being misdiagnosed. But first I want to introduce myself, as she said, my name is Jennifer Melendez. I born in Ibonito, Puerto Rico. I'm a small business owner and advocate for HAT and Angemol syndrome. Both are rare condition present in my family. Uh, today I'll be focusing in HAT. Uh, HAT the abbreviation for hereditary hemorrhagic telecatasia. Um, I can't remember the exact conversation that brought up HAT to my attention. I only know that one day my mom showed me a letter with my grandfather diagnosed and the name she used it was Osler Weber Raymond. I was just starting college and surprised me that a lot because in my mind I was asking why now. So I went to my mom pneumologist for a consult. He sent me to a 
full body CT scan, there was no evidence of any malformation related to HAT in any of my organs. Either way, he told me that I need to be alert of the symptoms that can occur. So years later, I got, I got pregnant of my first child. I went to my OBG when I was completing the registrative form. It was required to disclose my family history. Uh, of course, I put HAT. When the doctor read, sent me to my pneumology. So I went to him again. He looks at me and some sm uh, red small spot on my skin. I write a note to my OBG, misdiagnosing me with HHT and specifying my delivery must, must be a C section. When I went back to my OBG and he read my doctor note, he didn't say nothing about me about nothing. He only gave me instruction to talk to his secretary. Uh, she's the person that told me that my pregnancy was a considered high risk. And I had to go to the San Juan Municipal Hospital for special care. I was part of an unprivileged population that had no option for second opinion because of my medical insurance and service availability. So believe me, I tried. I tried, I didn't find option. Since that day, my nightmare started. Long story short, uh, about nine under training OBGs treat me during my pregnancy. Neither of them made me a sonogram to check my baby. They only run my baby and check my centimeters. Uh, no family was allowed to make me company, including my husband. Their inconsistency during treatment and wrong practice create more risks than safety for an for an unprivileged high-risk patient. One day, one of his OBGYN shaking the dilatation was so rough at me that I started bleeding nonstop. They sent me to home, but I came back later that day, bleeding didn't stop. Me and my son almost died that day due to the blood loss and high blood pressure during C-section surgery. Years later, moved to Tennessee we, because my son was having development issue and the genetics performed some tests find the root cause of my son's condition and they found we found it with a diagnostic of animal syndrome. But they also made me some tests to his father and me. And that's the moment I discovered for my surprise that I don't have HAT. The damage was already done. I must live with the trauma. In my case, everything could have been so different if they made me one simple blood test. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your um, story, Jennifer. And I, I can't wait to hear more about how, how this misdiagnosis has greatly affected your life. Mm -hmm. um, and now we will hear from Erica Stalling. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Erica Stallings. I am a lawyer, uh, writer, and patient advocate. I am based in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, although today I'm actually Dalian from Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, because that is where my fiance is teaching this semester. So never a dull moment over here. Um, I'm really excited to be here because um, the issues that we're talking about um, are ones that I'm really passionate about, which I'll sort of um, explain as I walk through my story. Uh, so I always tell people my genetics from my B or C story, uh, it really starts with my mom all the way back in 1993. Uh, my mom was a two-time breast cancer survivor, and she first learned that she had breast cancer um, when she was only 28 years old, um, like I said, in 1993. But this was a couple of years before scientists had made the connection between, um, you know, genetics and hereditary cancer and breast cancer. So she, you know, undergoes a mastectomy, she undergoes chemotherapy and radiation, and then she's in remission for 14 years. Uh, until she faces a second diagnosis um, of triple negative breast cancer my senior year of college uh, at the university of, when I was enrolled at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And I always kind of pause the story here because, you know, I grew up in a pretty rural town in uh, eastern North Carolina. Um, and even when I look today, I don't think there are genetic counselors uh, within 50 miles of where I grew up. Um, but we were really fortunate that because I was enrolled at UNC, my mom decided to do her breast cancer treatment there. Uh, and that's when her oncologist recommended that she um, undergo genetic, uh, genetic counseling and testing. 
So we learned that my mom carries a BRCA2 mutation, um, which meant that I knew um, basically around the age of 22, 23, uh, that I had a 50% chance of carrying that mutation as well. But I was starting law school, uh, I was moving to Washington, DC, uh, and that didn't feel like a good time to get tested. And then after I like moved to New York to you know start my career as an attorney, uh, those first couple of years were really crazy. But when I turned 28, uh, which was the same age my mom was when she got diagnosed, I decided it was time to, you know, sort of seek out genetic genetic testing. Um, and I know we're talking a lot about this disparities in, in this panel today. Um, and I do always really emphasize to people that I understand that I had a lot of privileges going into the experience. Um, I often tell people that I feel like I experienced this as like a privileged white woman um, because I had really good health insurance. Like I had a job that allowed me to take off as much time as I needed. And I lived in New York City where I had access to um, all kinds of specialists. But I, I go to get genetic testing at NYU. Um, I get the result that uh, I'm positive for the same BRCA2 mutation that my mom has. Um, and the oncologist tells me that I should pursue genetic, uh, so I pursue a mastectomy as soon as possible, um, which I don't think anyone is expecting to hear um, when they are like, you know, not even 30 years old. Um, so I, sp I spend the whole fall of 2014 um, preparing to, you know, undergo a mastectomy and deal with all the other um, associated health issues. And really for myself, like as I started going through this process, I started just doing a lot of research around um, health disparities um, in genetic testing, but also as it relates to like breast cancer, BRCA1 or BRC2, um, and really just became aware of all the um, disparities that exist, which I know we'll talk about today, but specifically like who gets the referral, like who gets access to like the best care, um, who even gets to have conversations around like um, breast reconstruction and everything like that. So um, that's actually really when I started my uh, kind of like side career or passion as a patient advocate. Um, I wrote an experience about being a black woman with BRCA uh, for Jezebel. And then that sort of spiraled into um, eventually starting the Young Leadership Council uh, for the Bassler Center for BRCA. Um, the Bassler Center is a research institution at University of Pennsylvania. All they do is research BRCA-related cancers. Um, so for the past five years, I've like led that Young Leadership Council and we help raise money and we support young investigators who um, you know, are doing money into BRCA-related causes. Um, I also like helped UPenn um, work to create a genetic a scholarship for genetic counselors to help like diversify the um, the workforce, which I know is another thing we're going to talk about today. Um, but for me, like the reason that I do this work and the reason that these like events like this panel are so important to me is that when you really look at like cancer disparities in this country, I know we always talk about, oh, like we need to do more research, we need to have more innovative treatment, but there's so many lives that could be saved um, if we just made sure that there was a level playing field for everybody. Like, I believe there was a study a couple months ago that like, if you literally just gave black women the same care you give white women, you could like drive down breast cancer disparity rates by like 20%, right? Um, and we know that genetics is really a big piece of that. Um, and something that I think about a lot. And so like, I hope the providers who are like in this audience, like, you know, really listening um, is that genetics is so powerful, um, right? I think so much about how it's impacted me. I got the chance to prevent breast cancer. You know, if I have kids, they will too. But at the same time, if we don't like, really diversify and get a handle on this, you're gonna see genetics like greatly increase the disparities um, that we see like amongst like minorities and whites in the cancer world. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox because uh, I'm just supposed to be doing my intro and I'll get off my soapbox later. Uh, but, but thank you again uh, for inviting me to be here. And I'm really excited to be with my fellow panelists. Thank you, Erica, and we'll definitely give you more of an opportunity to speak more on those topics shortly. Okay, so now we have Andy Cantor, Certified Genetic Counselor. I am a genetic counselor with Integrated Genetics Lab Corps. Um, I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I am a real life non-binary person. And I was trying to figure out like what, um, what piece of my journey I wanted to share. Cause I, I do want to tell you about like, you know, my, myself and my background being a non-binary person. Um, but I also really want to tell you about like why I started doing this work, which starts about two and a half years ago. So long after I knew that I was a non-binary person, but, um, I, I had always, uh, kind of, um, made the internal decision that like my personal life and my professional life needed to be separated. Like I couldn't really be open about my identity, like in the genetic counseling community, um, from, you know, from the time I was a student, um, it was something that was like pretty clear to me that it wasn't like 
common. Like it wasn't really something that was talked about at all in the genetic space. Um, so I kind of figured, you know, it's fine. Like I don't need to like bring this to my professional world. Uh, I can, you know, take care of that in my in my personal life. I can be who I am in my personal life. But then I went to the 2019 NSGC conference and there was a talk by Caitlin Brown uh, titled Genetics Beyond the Binary. And that was the first time that I had heard anybody talk about the difference between sex and gender in a genetic space. And she talked about um, intersex patients and also trans and non-binary patients and how we should be thinking differently about uh, you know, talking to these patients, uh, what language we should be using, like pedigree symbols that we should be using. Uh, and my world kind of got turned upside down. Uh, and uh, I was leaving that conference with my boss's boss who was also attending that talk. And she said to me, you know, I really wish that we had some kind of uh, resource for our group or that we could like put together some kind of talk for our group within uh, integrated genetics so that people can learn more about this stuff because it seems really important and there really aren't a lot of conversations about this. And without thinking about it, I said, I'll do it. Uh, so that was exactly two years ago today was uh, when I gave that first talk. And I know it was exactly two years ago because it was my birthday in 2020. Uh, and uh, it was my first quarantine birthday party. So that was a very intense experience uh, to be uh, giving this talk for the first time and also coming out to my coworkers for the first time as a non-binary person, as part of giving this talk and using myself as, as, as an example of what somebody like this looks like. Because I didn't want to be closed off. If I'm going to be talking about this stuff, I wanted to be open and I wanted to be an example of what a non-binary person can look like and that we are real, we exist. Um, so uh, after that, um, uh, word kind of seemed to spread like wildfire because there wasn't a lot of information about this stuff in our space. So I got asked to do talk after talk after talk. I did a talk for the prenatal SIG. I did a talk for um, the New York State Task Force. I got invited to do NSGC uh, last year. Um, I did um, a talk for the, uh, the um, Texas uh, 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 Annual Conference for Genetic Counselors, for the Pennsylvania Association for Genetic Counselors, for the New York, uh, for the uh, North Carolina uh, Association for Genetic Counselors. I've done a couple of lectures for different genetic counseling programs, also been involved in um, patient research studies. A lot of patients, uh, oh, sorry, uh, of uh, student research studies, I cannot talk today. Um, uh, and uh, I, uh, one of my favorite things about doing this work and being out about this work is there have been a lot of students and also a lot of other genetic counselors who have reached out to me uh, to come out to me, to tell me that I am not alone, that they are also trans or non-binary, they are also part of my community. Um, and it's been pretty overpowering uh, to not only receive the response to wanting to give this training that people in this community do want this education. They do want to learn how to take care of my community better, but also to actually start to build a community within the genetic counseling space. So that's, that's kind of been the most amazing and impactful thing for me. Thank you for sharing and happy, happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're so happy um, to have you on this panel. So, um, Lastly, but definitely not least, we have Amanda De Leon, who's also a genetic counselor. Hey, yes, thank you for um, giving me this space to talk. I'm really honored just to be able to talk amongst all these amazing panelists. Um, I'm a cancer genetic counselor at um, UT Southwestern out in Northern Texas. Um, and so my background probably begins with my family. Um, it's a big part of my identity. And they moved here um, from Latin America, wanting to give my family a better life. And so they were my first role models of what an advocate is. And so thanks to these amazing women who led my families, I've had the privilege and sometimes the challenge of navigating both my Hispanic roots and my American roots. And one privilege that I'm blessed with is being able to speak in both Spanish and in English. Um, because of this skill and my background, I now advocate for my community by trying to raise awareness about barriers that exist for Spanish speaking and immigrant patients trying to make trying to access these genetic counseling services. Um, I also feel it's important to make action happen and has started to work on resources to address some of these barriers, including Spanish resources with the, the Minority Genetics Professional Network, and then also genetic services for genetic providers in the US and Latin America. So one thing I'm working on right now is with the Latin American Society of Genetic Counseling and increasing access to genetic services in Latin American communities. Um, so I'll talk more later, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out now or, or later. 
Great, thank you, Amanda. And we're definitely looking forward um, to hearing more about your experience during the panel. Um, right now we have time just to have a quick break. Um, and I also want to give everyone an opportunity to drop some questions in the chat that you would like to ask the panelists. And we'll see if um, we can get to all of them through the panel today. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much, Erica. So we'll get a, go ahead and get started um, with the panel. So our first question is for Erica Stallings. What unique challenges did you face or do you see patients facing and getting referrals to specialists or diagnosis coming from an underserved community? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick, but I, I'll say one of my own personal experience, um, you know, it was really interesting because when I finally decided to get genetic testing, I had decided to do it at Memorial Sloan Kettering. But at the time they had a six month wait list um, from the time we made the appointment. And that would have been fine, except that by the time the six months had rolled around, I was switching jobs and I didn't have health insurance coverage um, for the month of the appointment. And when I called to ask them if I could just move the appointment, they were like, by like three weeks, essentially, they were like, no, like if you move it, you got to come back in like six months, right? Now, granted, um, I was really lucky. I had um, a pretty well-resourced network in New York City who helped me just like get an appointment somewhere else. But I certainly understand um, for someone who one either doesn't have health insurance or has already had to like really psych themselves up to, to do that. Like I think calling someone and being told that I think is, a, is, is something that could definitely be a barrier. Um, the other thing that I encounter a lot um, because I do wind up talking to so many um, black women or black families who are thinking about genetic testing is that I think I think there's like problems at like sort of every step of the genetic testing process, right? So I think the first is providers um, do one of two things, I think, right? Like they either assume that their black patients are not interested in genetic testing, so they don't talk about it with them, um, or they just don't think of this population as a population um, that is at risk for uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, or any of the other hereditary um, genetic mutations that we know of, right? I mean, even when I was going through my experience of having a mastectomy, I had a doctor comment to me like that they didn't understand how I had BRCA because I didn't have um, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, right? Um, so I think there's problems with like, I think there's problems with just like getting the referral. But I think even when you get the referral, you know, most people see like an OBGYN or like a PCP, they're not seeing these specialists who can really help people like navigate and manage these situations. So then you see like a drop off. Um, we know that there are disparities. Um, that even when Black women are actually able to get the testing, um, they may not be engaging um, in risk-reducing mastectomy or risk-reducing um, overectomy at the same rate um, as, our white, as our white counterparts. Um, and I think finally, you know, I know this, is, this probably doesn't seem like a, a big issue, but it's something that I think about a lot. Um, you know, there are disparities like in, in reconstruction. Um, like probably the requests that I get from people beyond just like wanting to talk about genetic testing is I get a lot of black women who reach out to me and ask me like if I'm willing to show them um, pictures of my reconstruction because they go to their plastic surgeon's office and they don't see any black women in these um, in the result books right and we know that black women um, scar differently and heal differently right and so I do think that is really psychologically important you know we know that right now like for BRC one and two um, really the main risk reduction technique is mastectomy right and if you're not offering uh, like the, the really important like cosmetic part of that, I do think it has an impact on people's like willingness to like test and engage. Um, and then I think finally, like we really need to like develop better tools um, in helping people like navigate these conversations with their family. Like as much as I'm like a patient advocate who talks about this stuff all the time, like I have family members who just like refuse to like engage with us, right? Um, and it's something that I keep coming back to and I keep coming back to, but you know, if I'm someone who like, I'm thinking about genetics all the time and I don't really know how to have the tools to like talk about this with my family. Um, I think that that is something that's like also a, a, a huge gap. Um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Cause I think some of the other stuff I'm about to hear into touches on other topics. Michelle, you're muted again. I am so sorry. Does anyone else have anything else they wanna to add to that question? Actually, you know, let me also just say one more thing because I talked about this mm -hmm. really briefly in my intro, just like being near a genetic, a genetic counselor, right? So we know that there's like a shortage of, we know there's a shortage of genetic counselors. You know, where I grew up, no genetic counselors, right? Just have been really fortunate. My mom got treated at academic center. 
I happen to live in New York City. But we know that there are, um, there's like a rural divide with respect to who has, you know, access to genetic counseling testing. And even if you're like a patient, let's say you like live in Philadelphia or New York City, um, we know there's racial disparities in like who goes to certain places, right? Like Memorial Sloan Kennery and NYU and Mount Sinai see a much more wider population um, than a place like, a, than like a Bellevue, right? And so even within cities, you may not have equally um, distributed access to genetic counseling and testing. So I think that that's a huge one. And we even know that with telemedicine, which is kind of like the thing that everyone has been pushing is like, oh, this is like, will help us like get more access. There's also racial disparities in who accesses like telemedicine, right? So I think like the access to the, the genetic counselor um, it is really at the heart of it. And then all the other disparities I mentioned kind of like spin out from that. Yeah, really great insight, Erica, thank you. Um, so for Amanda, how does privilege show up in your experience? Yeah, um, and I'll kind of, it's kind of like a bit of, of the first question and the second question. So we'll be able to answer a little bit of both. Perfect. But, um, in terms of that, I think there's a lot of privilege that we as providers have. So we are experts in our field with a very clear idea of how genetic services or how our service works. So as we start making strides now to increasing access and awareness to genetic services, we also need to match these services to our community. So um, a lot of research has already shown that people want the answers, patients want genetic services, but there are barriers along the way that can make it difficult for these patients. So I'm gonna highlight some of the barriers for limited English proficient and immigrant patients, since that's where I um, do a lot of my work in, but there are definitely other barriers that, um, that um, others might highlight as well. So I think one initial step to genetic testing might be getting flagged as having a suspicious family. And I think that was a question brought up, so I might be able to answer a little bit. But I think family and family medical history is such a complex topic. Cancer and illness can be considered taboo topics. Wars, unrest, immigration, so not being in the same country, all of these might play a role in communication of information in a unique way of these communities. And then there might be unique ways to describe a health issue, for example, in Spanish compared to English. I've heard many providers struggle to decide how to label cancer de matriz or a female cancer. If, is it gonna be considered something that meets criteria or is it something that doesn't meet criteria for genetic testing? That's one thing that has come up. Um, or how about if they've gotten past the barrier of getting that referral and now they need to get to the appointment? Do they, how do they schedule the appointment if the call is in English or if there's a cost of genetic testing or just even getting there, for example? And then say they make it past that barrier, now you're disclosing the results to the patient and now they're positive. Maybe you found out they do have a hereditary cancer condition. I'm a cancer genetic counselor, so I will focus on that. But say that comes back. Um, and so then there's this issue of, well, now that they're positive, you want them to be able to do something about that. So what resources are you gonna to recommend to them? Are they resources that they can use with their insurance? Put them in the language that they preferred? Is it at a readability that makes sense? Um, cascade testing, you're going to tell them, oh, their kids need genetic testing or their siblings need genetic testing. Well, if they're not in the same country, you're pretty much telling them, here's something that you can't do, but I need you to do it. So I think there's a lot of privilege when we tell them something or when we expect something from our patients that we assume is possible if, if we haven't thought through all those things. So um, as a sneak peek to my next one about goals we might want to encounter, I think patient navigators, community health workers, bilingual staff, help the patient navigate these tricky healthcare systems we work in. So if you don't know about this or if you can't provide these resources, encourage your department to have staff or become aware of services that can. So I think just making sure to be more and more aware of what we have available. And I'll talk more next. Thank you, Amanda. And Scott, same question for you. How has privilege showed up in your experience? Oh, you're muted. Yep, I'm following your footsteps. I know, so, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Setting uh, no, a bad standard. <laughs> yeah. So privilege, I guess, for me. So being here in Washington, D.C., where um, it's very easy to find healthcare professionals that look like me. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I have, uh, I've known my doctor for many, many years. He's now my primary care. Um, I can go to him for just about anything. So uh, the privilege shows up in that I have access um, um, and, and that I'm, you know, because my mother was in the healthcare, uh, healthcare, uh, she was an, an, a nurse um, uh, and growing up around 
that level of education. Um, I know how to conduct myself uh, in front of healthcare professionals. Um, and I think that, and that has led me to be um, not shy about my healthcare. I'm, I'm very bold with it. I'm very direct um, about my care. Um, and one example that, that kind of comes up is that I had, <clears throat> I went to see a doctor about, about something in my care. <laughs> And he wanted to tell me what it, you know, what was going on with me. And so we, we got into this very, it wasn't contentious, but it was a very um, stressful state when I asked him or told him to show me, don't tell me, but show me, you've got the x-rays, show me. And so in, he was in front of his, uh, I guess, one of his PAs and it got a little stressful and he didn't want to do it, but he ended up doing it. Anyway, I don't see him anymore, but, um, but that's kind of my personality is that I want to drive. I'm responsible for my care and I make sure that I get the care that I feel that I deserve. So that's, that's a privilege here that, that that's easy for me to step into being in this area, in this community. It's great. And it's not something that's easy for everybody and that everybody feels empowered to do one of the barriers that we came up with. Exactly. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, Zarifa, how did you get your seat at the table to have your voice heard? Well, that's a great question. I always make sure um, if there's any, if there's not a representation of someone of color who has a disability, um, who is living in uh, the LGBT plus community, I always make sure to ask the question, what is your panel like? What is the panelist made up? What's the representation of your panel discussion or the, the conversation? Because I believe representation means everything. Um, if I don't see myself, it doesn't exist to me. And that's what I look at when it comes to having a seat at the table, just to spread that knowledge and education out. Because a lot of people just don't, don't know. So if you don't know, you're not going to be able to actually ask the questions, have a seat at the table, and have that conversation and to bring that awareness. So I believe education is the number one key factor to make sure we we'll always have that conversation, we we'll always have that a diverse representation of diversity at the table because too many times the underrepresented groups are left out in that conversation and then you have other people having the conversation without us being at the table to have th that we need to have that conversation so mm -hmm. always yes very important thank you Zarifa what yeah. um what should, I'll give this question to Andy first. What should our goals be going forward to make a more inclusive and appropriate genetics care? Ooh, what an easy question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh God, there's so much that we need to do. Um, we are such a, um, we are a profession that is uh, so rooted historically in eugenics and in racism and in ableism and in uh, transphobia. Um, we are, our institutions are so like fundamentally grounded in these things um, and in colonialism. Um, so uh, there is so much work to be done to unlearn all of these ways of thinking that we have all been raised in in our culture and that we have all uh, adopted as part of our practice. Um, and I think for a lot of us, it's very easy to not notice the things that don't impact us. Um, and uh, you know, it's wonderful that this is starting to be more of a discussion and people are starting to listen more to other people's experience. Um, and like actually realize that there are things that are impacting other people who aren't like them that aren't impacting them. Uh, but in terms of what we need to do, I think we're doing the first step. I think the conversation is happening. Um, and I think we need to be willing to understand that the only way that we can actually have a genuinely 
inclusive and uh, just medical system is to pull it up by the roots, to like really be willing not to make small changes, but to make really, really big changes, um, not to be afraid of like, uh, you know, r ripping your system apart and rebuilding it from the ground up and uh, taking into consideration ideas that are not easy. Like, you know, it's not necessarily going to be uh, cheap to rebuild the things that we need to rebuild. Um, and sometimes it can be scary. Sometimes uh, it can make us afraid that people will like uh, judge us or like think we're, um, you know, like the bad guy for, uh, you know, not having other kinds of identities um, uh, than what we have. Uh, like thinking about one of the questions that I saw in the chat, like it, it can be confronting to be somebody who doesn't share the kinds of identities that are impacted by uh, the oppressive systems that we're working under and to feel like, you know, other people are viewing us as the oppressor um, and to just sort of sweep it under the rug as a result of that. Um, but I think at, at the end of the day, the answer to your question is, I think what we need is to be brave. <laughs> To, to be brave and to really genuinely listen with an open heart and try to let go of defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Awesome. 100% agree. Um, Amanda, want to answer same question? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, and so I think um, in terms of things that we can kind of highlight, I have a couple big ones and then one that's a little bit more like um, a smaller goal, we can say. So I think one that was talked about earlier would just be the delivery model of services. Um, so I work at a center that's academic and then also an underserved county populations as well as a couple of private clinics. And we noticed that a really big difference by offering telephone um, services. So I think just thinking about what options are working for patients, what options are giving patients that access that they need when it's work hours or when it's after work hours, we've offered a little bit later hours as well. So I think just thinking about the patient population and what they need is something that's really helpful. I think follow through and follow up. Um, so one thing that might be really helpful is giving those patients the opportunities to, to receive the resource, but then making sure that there's a way to stay connected after. So um, for example, we have um, people check in with the patient a week later just to see, did they receive all the information they need? Did they get the letter that you said you were gonna to send to them? Um, did they need another letter for another family member? Or maybe now they were able to reach their family member and the family member has a question about this. So I think follow through is really helpful. Um, support staff is also really helpful. Having promotoras, having community health workers, having patient navigators, getting patients into the system, um, maybe through the mammography system or colonoscopy system that's already set up. Um, having diverse staff who can speak the same language as the patients, I think is really helpful. Um, these are all big steps that, that people might say, oh, I, I don't have that funding or I don't have that resource. I think then a smaller goal to start off would be do, do an assessment of the care that you're providing for your patients. What are things that are working? What are things that could be improved upon? And then talk with your department or talk with other healthcare systems to see what they are doing. So I think continuing to check in on yourself as a provider and an advocate is something that you can do right now as a small step to, um, to make changes. So that would be for me. Amanda, that's really great. Those are really great actionable things. I would love it if you could like drop those in the chat for people to jot down or take note on if you want to. But I think those are really good action items that people can take away from this panel. Um, Erica, same question. Um, what have you got on this topic? Yeah, um, so 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 one thing I've been thinking a lot about, which I, I think is tied to to the role like the workforce and how you make your nice care more inclusive, um, is that at least as, at least as far as I know, um, and I feel like I spend a lot of time on the internet, so I think I'm right about this. Um, is that there? I haven't seen any sort of like targeted education around like genetics or hereditary cancer or things like Lynch syndrome, BRCA, BRCA2, right, like aimed at minority communities. Um, and the reason I think that's really important, I actually think that that's something like genetic counselors can play a role in, is that, you know, in order for a patient to want to engage with genetic counseling and testing, they have to think that it's relevant to them. And if they never see, you know, a minority patient talking about genetics or even just any type of awareness campaign, 
they're not going to think it's they're not going to think it's relevant to them. Um, there, there's actually like research um, about this, not specifically around genetics, um, but there's a researcher at UNC Chapel Hill who like measured how Black women think about breast cancer. And a lot of Black women were like, well, I never see myself in like the pink walks. I never see myself like featured in stories in October. So Black women actually like underestimated their risk for breast cancer. Although we know actually their risk like under the age of 50 is like higher than white women. So I think that sort of just like general um, targeted minority awareness of genetics and genetic conditions is actually a very actionable thing. Um, you know, gen genetic, I think ge genetic counselors have a role to play. Um, you know, I think I've already hit on some concepts around like, and 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 because I'm looking at Barbara's comment, I, you know, I will say for me, like, I think the loneliest part of like having a BRCA experience was like, I didn't see any stories from anybody who like looked like me, right? And obviously I had a lot of class privilege like going into it, um, but we know that race like impacts everything that we do. Um, and the fact that I just like never saw a story from like a black woman or a black woman who didn't have kids yet or like a black woman who was unmarried, like it made this experience that was already like really hard and isolating, like that much more um, isolating. Um, you know, I think we've talked a lot, a lot about um, like increasing the genetics workforce. Um, and this is another place I wanna shout out Barbara uh, because I know that they have like the golden project, which is like working to like increase awareness of genetic counseling, like as a, um, a profession at HB, HBCUs and other places. Um, I think work like what UPenn is doing with respect to the scholarship, you know, like making like making genetic counseling, not just like something that is an interesting career path for minorities, but also providing like a way to like make it financially possible. Because if you're a minority student who like has a STEM background, you can go do anything. So you have to make it like financially attractive to like be a genetic uh, counselor. And I guess the last thing I'll say, cause I know there was a comment in the chat about, you know, the importance of um, having POC providers. And, I, and I, I, I talk about how important that is all the time. That being said, like my oncologist who did my genetic testing is white, like my OBGYN who I see for ovarian screenings are white, right? Um, but, but we have a trust and respect and we have a real trust and respect that I know that they like listen to me and my concerns are heard. And anytime I've ever called to be like, I have this weird pain near my implant, it, it's probably not cancer. Can you just like order an MRI or screen? Like they're so responsive. Um, and, and so I think like, we know like racial concordance for providers is really important because it builds that trust. But I also think that like, if you are a white provider, like seeing minority patients, just like understanding the dynamic that is going on in that room and like taking the extra steps to like listen and engage and be responsive. Like, I think that goes such a long way in like making that trust relationship because there's so many times when I see a new provider, like I'm, I go into those rooms like ready to fight. Like my default assumption is you're not gonna listen to me and I'm gonna have to pull out every credential in the book of how like I'm a lawyer and my best friend is a doctor and she's married to a cancer oncologist and I know what I'm talking about, right? And so when a when a when a white provider or really any provider signals to me that like I don't have I can like drop that armor and just like be there and like be a patient, it, it goes like such a long it goes such a long way. Thank you, thank you, Erica. Um, Andy, through your work with the, within genetics, what voices would you say are missing or need to be heard more? of people of color, like at just like we've been talking about, um, it is an overwhelmingly white uh, field. Uh, the queer community, the LGBTQIA plus community, um, the disabled community. Um, I think all of, you know, all the stuff we've already talked about is like the, the voices that we need to hear today. Um, those are the voices that we need more in the genetics community. Um, you know, specifically because of what Erica was just talking about is like, uh, it, it is so meaningful for patients to have providers that they can see themselves in. Um, and it's, it's just going to make us better as a profession by having uh, more, more points of view and more diversity. Thank you. And um, Jennifer, what efforts do you see being put into action that you think are making an impact or or going to make an impact in the future? Um, I remember uh, years ago uh, when I heard about HAT, looking on the internet and found too little information. 
But now with the social media, I can even connect with doctors that are raising boys to make difference in some medical conditions. And I found a foundation that are like 30 years old. I didn't know that existed. And they are making an impact looking for treatment or cure or conditions. So we are more connected now with family, patient, medical professional than in the past. So I remember also, I was asked many times what my community really needs. And the answer is the opportunity uh, for us to expose us, to raise our community a voice. Also, I can see there are more effort to educate that the medical condition, uh, community, I'm sorry, to increase knowledge about the rare disease and the patient to be more educated so about the condition so they can have better treatment related to the symptom resulting in more accurate diagnosis. Because I think every person deserves to have the right diagnosis and be cared with the right treatment. Thank you. And I'm, I'm hearing a theme from all the panelists about how important representation is. It seems like it's one of the most important steps yeah. and starting places and everything flows from that. Mm -hmm. um, Andy, same question for you. What efforts do you see being put into action that should have an impact or hopefully have an impact going forward? Oh, you're muted. It was going to happen at some point. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I've been really encouraged by um, is the, the conversations that we have been having um, uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion as a genetic counseling community. Um, I have also been personally really encouraged by the changes that I've been seeing happening over the last couple of years, just in terms of um, forms or uh, like intakes. Uh, where more questions are being asked uh, about gender identity uh, and like language is being changed. So I, uh, a couple of years ago, like I could not remember a single time that I had seen a test requisition form that actually said like assigned male at birth and assigned female at birth instead of like male or female. Uh, and that's happening all the time now. And that is I, a direct result of these conversations happening. And I am certain uh, genetic counselors and especially lab genetic counselors, like I wanna call them out here. I think lab genetic counselors have been making a lot of noise about their TRFs and making appropriate changes to the language in their TRFs to be more inclusive, which leads to a higher accuracy. So that is, is one small change that I am seeing happening, but uh, it, it does uh, bring me a lot of hope that more is coming. That's great, thank you. Um, Scott, what are your thoughts about how to make genetics research more inclusive of diverse populations, especially as someone who's participated in research? Right. And so I'll answer a couple of the questions that I see in the chat that have, um, uh, that have, have something to do with being more inclusive. Um, so um, a couple of people have asked how I learned about uh, the clinic study and one of the things that um, that really caught my eye was one we we heard these at, at church because we live in Washington D.C. and there's um, uh, a lot of Black people in this city. Um, a lot of the marketing and outreach was done at churches, and so I remember seeing something posted on a on a board, and I want to say um, I want to say there was someone that spoke that gave an announcement about the Clin Seek study. Um, I know our minister, um, you know, she, I, you know, she, she did it. Um, and, uh, and so I became kind of an advocate for the study because I wanted to see the study funded. So I was interested in getting more people of color into the study. It was right here in Bethesda, you know, it was easy. <clears throat> the other thing that, that I knew, um, was that, um, uh, these tests were worth thousands of dollars, and I did not have to go through my health plan. Uh, and so the value in having tests, uh, you know, having a baseline test that I could take that was independent of my health plan, because at the time there was, there, there, there was time about pre, talk about pre-existing conditions, and I didn't want anything that my health plan would find in, in any of my results 
being known as a pre-existing condition and then I something happens and I'm not treated for it. So, so that was kind of the sizzle, not the stake that made it more sellable for me. Um, I do have a lot of uh, friends, black men that, you know, they don't want to see a doctor. And so I'm constantly uh, speaking with them, constantly talking about the value of finding answers and not being surprised. Um, and, and so that's kind of the advocacy that I'm doing on the ground in my own community is, is making sure. But, but, um, but I think the Clean Seek study was, uh, was a great way to kind of kick this off. And, uh, and, um, and so, yeah, friends and family were very uh, encouraged by it. Um, you know, I didn't hear anything bad about it. I, I knew really what I was doing and I was looking for the value uh, that these tests were going to give me. So that's kind of why. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I don't know if that answers the questions about uh, be, being more inclusive, but short, just a short quip on just being more inclusive. I think we need to teach populations that are going through genetic testings, what and how, how and what to do with the information. That's going to make it, that's going to make it make sense. It's going to close the loop because it's a lot of information about markers and this is that and the implication. What, what am I going to do with this? So teaching them how to navigate that, those results, I think is really what's going to help people be more, feel more included in what they're participating in. Great, thank you. And Erica, um, what are your thoughts on this, this topic? Yeah, I think a lot of mine um, echoes echo Scott. So I'll, I'll try to be I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I I'm always a big believer in in one like the, the power of representation, right? So you know, which I think has been a current theme, a constant theme throughout this panel. So like engaging minorities who have participated in research, right? So that people see see themselves and understand what's going on. Um, I will also say in the context of genetics, um, I know there's also some research in like research in the literature around the fact that a lot of minority patients have questions about like how their data is going to be used right and so I think a really, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna say easy but a possible thing to do right is like very targeted education around the laws that we know exist. Um, like the like Gina the genetic information non discrimination acts. Um, I also think there's always a lot of value in like bringing the research to where people are. Um, we know from studies that black men are more likely to engage um, in like uh, cardiovascular screenings, right? When you bring doctors like to barbershops, when you bring stuff to where like, um, you know, we have to bring stuff to where people are. Um, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I was, there was one more thing I wanted to say and I can't think of it. Um, but, the, but the other thing I wanted to highlight, because we were talking about like how to be more inclusive. Um, I know there are a lot of people like listening to this panel. Um, so if somebody wants to fund this, it would be great because it's something that I would really like to see. You know, we know that like most women, like they get um, care from like a primary care physician or like an OBGYN. Um, and in particular, um, you know, you have a lot of patients who maybe they wind up doing their like annual women's screening at like a Planned Parenthood. You know, and I'd love to see some type of like partnership where like you have a genetic counselor who's just like embedded in like a Planned Parenthood or like a community health center, like once or twice a week, right? So instead of a patient having to like get the referral, navigate how to like get to where the genetic counselor is, like you kind of like bring them out into like Bahamas. Um, so, so like, you know, so, so I think that that is really important. Um, and the last thing I'll say, cause then I feel like I'm, ram I'm rambling what I wanted to touch on earlier. Um, is, is the other thing that I've here I have encountered a lot is, you know, black patients who have like gone through genetic testing and then they've gotten like a variant of unknown significance. Um, and they feel really betrayed when they get the VUS, right? Because they're like, someone told me that this was really important and I really needed to do it. And I went through all of it. And now you're telling me that you can't even like tell me what I have and like and what my risk is, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to sort of like tie the importance of research and getting into these databases to stuff like that, right? Like, look, the more people that get into these databases, like the more that we can like give people actionable um, information. Um, so I, I think like also just like, I just wanted to note the importance of like connecting it to VUS. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, Iris reminded me, I'll be really quick. There is a woman at Vanderbilt University. Her name is like Karen Winkfield and she's great. She's a black woman. Uh, and she she was one, she's like 
she's a radiation oncologist, which is really rare. And she was talking about, you always hear people say like the, the, the like non-compliant patient or like the reluctant patient. And she's like, I am always able to get my black patients to like commit to chemotherapy or radiation because I will take as much time as they need for me to sit with them and like hear their questions and like talk them through what is a very scary process. And I think people have to be willing to do the same thing with research, right? Like, you know, if the if a patient's not interested the first time, but you think it's beneficial, like you just have to like do it again, do it again, like and like have that sympathetic ear, right? It can't just be like I engaged once and you don't want to do it. So like you're not compliant or like not interested, right? Like it it is a it's a process. So I, I actually will stop now. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. <laughs> All great points. Um, so now we have a little bit of time to take some questions from the chat. So I'm just going to go with what I see here um, to Andy. Have you faced backlash or issues from your patients for being a non-binary genetic counselor? Question. I hope that um, whoever you are, I hope you're non-binary. And if you are, uh, please find me and reach out to me and we can have like a, a more in-depth conversation about this. Um, if you're not, also a very good, very observant question as a non-binary person, um, because that is something that I think about a lot and that I agonize over because um, I talk to people all the time about like, you know, a great way of earning trust with your patients if they're trans or non-binary is to introduce yourself with your own pronouns to be like, hi, my name is uh, X, you know, I use she, her pronouns, I use he, him pronouns. Um, to be fully and completely transparent, I don't do that. I don't tell patients what my pronouns are, um, or I, I lie. I'll tell people, uh, you know, hi, my name's Andy. I'll, uh, I use she, her pronouns because I am not comfortable coming out to my patients. Um, I, uh, don't know how my patients would respond to that. Maybe it would be fine. Maybe people would feel less comfortable with me. Maybe people would be more aggressive to me. Maybe people would like ask me questions about myself. Maybe people would like hear that and like see my hair and like, uh, you know, not be as comfortable interacting with me um, or maybe respect me less as a genetic counselor. All of these are things that I'm telling myself, like, right? These are all like internal stories in my mind about this, but they're, uh, they're fears that come from a place of like, living in my society, like, you know, seeing the ways that uh, non-binary and trans people are treated, like in, in our media um, and in our politics. Uh, so I am not out to my patients. And <clears throat> uh, this is one of the reasons that like my dream job is to work exclusively with like trans and non-binary patients, or like at least in a setting where it's not, you know, always assumed that somebody is cisgender. Um, so that's my answer is I don't come out to my patients. I, I cannot remember a single time that I've ever come out to a patient as being non-binary, um, but it is certainly an interesting thing to think about. If you're non-binary and you want to talk about it more, uh, please uh, connect with me later. Thank you, Andy. Um, for Jennifer, thank you for sharing with us today. What makes you want to consider advocating for HHT since you discovered it was the wrong diagnosis for you? Uh, I start raising awareness because it's uh, what can help us to deliver a message um, that we are important um, because also because it's a hereditary uh, uh, disorder. My mom has it, my two sisters, my two brothers, so many, many family members that I care and I love with my life have it. So I start to, to give it a message. Um, in my case, I'm from the minority. I didn't, I don't speak well English, but I want to uh, close that barrier, uh, speak for my community, and I have uh, many people around me that need it. So I'm glad to, that I can do it a little, but um, I will continue to, to raise him always. Uh, and I will send the message that we, we're we here and we're more, more than one and we need equally importance. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Uh, for Sarifa, thank you for sharing your story. What is one suggestion or tip that you would like to share with genetic counselors and healthcare providers about being able to provide more culturally competent care to individuals from the disability community? 
Okay, Sheila. Repeat that question again. I'm sorry. sorry. I got people calling me and they don't know I'm on a conference call, putting people in a voicemail. I'm so sorry. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> what is one suggestion you would like to share with genetic counselors and healthcare providers about being able to provide more culturally competent um, care to individuals from the disability community? I would say get to know the person with a disability. Um, even their culture, because each person with a disability is totally different. I'm very open about my disability. Not everyone that has the same disability I have, or not everyone that has a disability want, wants, wants to share about the disability. So sometimes it takes um, the person, depending on the disability. I know this when I talk to my friends that have hidden disabilities, they're a little bit more a little bit more uh, close about sharing about their disability, their limitations. Um, they don't want to talk about it. They feel as though it's a negative. When I talk to some of my friends and colleagues that have a hidden, I mean, excuse me, visual disability, we're a little bit more open. We talk about limitations. We're very open with our doctors. And I remember having my um, surgery not the last surgery, but the surgery before last. Um, and I needed a, I was at this time within grad school and I needed a, um, what's that, uh, a speech therapist to go to. And I asked one of my professors, um, is there a, um, a place here, a hospital here that specialize in PT, OT and speech therapy? And she said, yes, Union Memorial. So, so my oral surgeon, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My oral surgeon, that every time he leaves me with um, other medical profession, they take the, I guess, my voice, my advocacy voice out of my hands, and they do whatever they want to do. And he gets very um, angry because he's like, this is not what I asked for. I only asked for one thing. And they went ahead and did what they wanted to do. And I didn't make a big deal about it. And so when I, um, before I got there, he called over there and was talking to the staff. He said, yes, this is Zarifa Robinson. She has all the right posters. And she, he was out there like, what's her independence level? And he was like, before I even start, I'm gonna let her advocate for herself. He didn't even say anything. He said, wait until you meet her. She will tell you everything which she can and cannot do. So I think it's based on that relationship you have with your, your, your medical community around you. Um, some people are not as open, um, more open. So it's, I think it's all about building that trust and that relationship with your medical community around you. It makes it more easy for you to be okay and comfortable and trusting your medical community around you with your care because these are the people that's going to care for you probably mm -hmm. for the rest of your life if that when you're having a disability so yeah thank you you're welcome and i think we have time for one last question here um this is for you erica how can gcs and other providers work to connect patients to resources and providers that will best benefit them uh that's a Oh gosh, that's that's a good that's a good question. Um, in, in part because I, unfortunately, at least speaking from like BRC one, BRC two, like I don't necessarily know if I think there are good resources that exist for like minority patients. Um, which isn't a critique; it's just like an observation. Like one thing that I would really like to see is like um, like like some very tailored like minority support groups for people who are, are dealing with this stuff. Um, but just so that I actually answer the question. Um, you know, I do think for patients in with genetic conditions, I think like peer support is like is really, really important. So to the extent that you are aware of like patient advocates or like patients that are in your practice who might be willing to like connect with, um, you know, a patient who's like now newly diagnosed and going through an experience, like I, I think that's a really important tool. Um, because speaking for myself, like I have actually found like referrals and doctors um, through like my through like my BRCA like peer support networks and I have like also um you know I've also like done that for other people um but but I also think like just in addition to like connecting people with um you know resources um 
you know, I, I also think it's about just like doing the work to like think about like your own like internal biases, right? And thinking about like, how can I get past those biases and like give my patient like a better experience? Um, you know, like something that like I, I have, I've been wanting to do, I just like have not had the, the bandwidth to do it. So maybe someone on this panel can like take the idea and run with it. Um, is I know I, I was talking to like a white OBGYN provider in uh, North Carolina who winds up seeing a lot of black patients. Um, and she was like, you know, I don't know how to talk to my black women patients about um, having their ovaries removed because I know that conversations around like sterilizations of black women, right? That's something that has been historically like been used against black women, right? And like, that's a really hard conversation for me to navigate as like a white woman. Um, and so I think having trainings for providers, right? On, on how to navigate stuff like that, like that was a really hard question. I was like, I'm black and I don't know the answer. I think like, I don't know the answer to give you for that, right? Like, but I think like creating um, like better provider education around like stuff like that, I also think like goes a long way. So peer support and then figuring out like how to pool and share resources um, amongst providers who I think are also trying to figure out like how to navigate all this stuff. That's great. Thank you, Erica. So um, with that, we're going to have an opportunity to um, take these conversations further and deeper into the breakout rooms. Um, so any other extra thoughts or ideas that anybody has, the, the breakout rooms will be a good opportunity to share that. And I would love for the panelists to join some of those rooms in case anyone has any further questions for you all. Um, and Erica, Yes, Mark. I'm right here for you. <laughs> Welcome. I'm putting the chat, the link in chat here for the discussion questions, Shayla. And they are, first question is about perspective change. So after hearing from the panelists, how has your perspective changed on, what, on how privilege impacts how patients and families access genetic services and genetics research? And then the second question, this one's really important, is about advancing to actions. What is one thing you can do differently in your own community or setting to address the disparities that exist within genetic services? So at the beginning of this presentation, you were asked, where can you make a difference? Maybe more than one place. And now this is the call to action to do something in that area. And this might be, we're gonna ask in chat for you to share those actions when you come back. So we can see what kind of actions have been leveraged as a result of all the hard work that's been shared here today. And actions, this can be, I'm gonna invite this one person to serve on this board. I'm gonna send this email. I'm going to, I'm gonna take just the action that could be something like just one invitation, one small thing that starts a chain that will make a difference. So anything you want to add to that, Shayla, before I get the final instructions on how breakouts will work? Um, no, the only thing I wanted to say is thank you so much um, to the panelists for your vulnerability and your openness, your honesty and sharing your story and your insights and everything. We'll have more opportunity to talk when we come back from the breakout rooms, but I just wanted to make sure that I said thank you before we broke off for the first time. Yes, and we will be back with you again. When you get in the breakout rooms, there is a prompt in a, uh, uh, to say, to honor Kadeem to say, if when you get in that room, whoever has a birthday coming up the most first, oh, I'm sorry, I think this was a call to Andy, uh, the birthday. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I knew I had this in my head. Um, whoever has a birthday coming up first, uh, you are invited to share first. All right, Fred, how are you doing with those rooms? We do have a generous amount of time in the afternoon at this moment so that people can really dig into these questions. If implemented, what would make the most significant difference to address barriers or privileges within genetic services or research? So whether or not you're the one to do it, what do you think would make the most significant difference? And then we will ask the group to share out the action steps that you will be doing. And I will share the results as they come in. Gail, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, that's great. That question is great. And if anyone has any extra thoughts outside of that, I think still feel free to drop them in the chat or um, in the Mentimeter, if that's okay. Here we go. All right, here come the answers. I 
I'd be curious, does anyone have any specific ideas on things that would make a difference that would help um, diversify the workforce? So we know we need diversity in the workforce, but what's an action step we can take in the right direction in order to do that? The uh, special interest groups, trying to be active in them, get them started up at, uh, you know, the university level and not just, uh, you know, before um, and making sure that, uh, you know, people with a bachelor's, uh, I had one person who decided to do social work, but she really wanted to be a counselor, but she'd already spent 35 grand on her social work degree and she didn't want to, you know, so making sure they know the options um, before they make a decision. Great, thanks. And I think there was a point um, Erica Stallings made during the panel about um, making genetics an appealing career to go into when someone can become a doctor or an engineer or things like that. Um, and sometimes even, you know, bringing what she said about bringing the information to where the people are, where those underrepresented populations are, instead of trying to bring them up to where you are. Um, see a good point about supporting trusted community representatives and sharing key health messages. Outreach to underserved populations about the need for participation in genetics research and testing. Healthcare reform to eliminate the need for patients to have private insurance and disparate ability to pay for services. All really, really great thoughts. Additional support for community healthcare workers, patient navigators, decreased financial burdens of higher education, big one. I see something about cultural competency for underserved populations. Maybe Sheila, while people are reading those, while the last few are coming in, I'm going to put that prompt in chat because now we've you've really primed the room here of what would make the biggest difference, where differences make a difference, and so. Um, so now is a great time for people to step forward and what can you do from your place of action? And this is not to ask people to do something that's beyond the scope of what they can do, but just what can you set in motion? What's something you could do that would start shifting this landscape? You can go ahead and share those in chat. We'll see what comes in. And it may take time for people to formulate that. She also maybe just go to closing any closing remarks. And then in a moment, we'll pass to Joanne, who will wrap up the conference. We will, we will have a time for that last takeaways poll about the entire day, because boys has been a production. And then there will be those opportunities for more breakout rooms for small group conversations. I'm going to turn it over to you, Shayla, completely to have the final words here. Thank you. Again, I just want to take the time to send many, many thanks to our panelists for sharing their stories and their vulnerability with everybody and the participation of the attendees. Thank you so much for making this a really rich discussion, asking great questions and um, sharing resources in the chat. I hope everyone um, leaves this, this workshop with at least one actionable thing that they can do in their community or in their practice. Um, and I hope we all become advocates for ourselves, our patients, our family members. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, everyone got something out of this really, really rich discussion.
And like uh, Eric has said, we'll have time right after this to if anyone can stick around to have further discussion, talk about takeaways and kind of have more breakout rooms.